All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This should be the second video of notes for, on the nervous system. Last time we talked about the structure and function of neurons. Today we're going to talk about how those things work. And to start off is with a really weird, cool concept of bioelectricity. This is electricity produced in a living being. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, you produce electricity. Actual electricity is coursing through your nervous system right now. Your neurons are going to send a bioelectric impulse, and they're going to use that to help send information. But no, the uh, information is not the electricity. They're just using the electricity to give the information a push. So what we are looking at is a neuron, one that you labeled last time. So quick refresher. These are the dendrites, the cell's body, and the nucleus. But today, what we care about is the axon and the axon terminal. And then we'll care about the dendrites of the next one. So inside this axon and outside, we have these things called ions. Now, you should remember ions from physical science. They're atoms, just like any other atom. They are just atoms, except there's a really weird thing about these atoms. They have a weird number of electrons. If you remember, an atom is supposed to have the same number of protons and neutrons and electrons, right? So carbon has six protons, six neutrons, six electrons, right? But if those electrons are numbered differently, then it's an ion. Now, electrons have a negative charge. So if you have too many ions, what you have is a negative ion. And we have those inside of your, uh, of your neurons, of the axon. And if you have not enough electrons, you now have a positive charge. So there are positive ions on the outside. And remember, electricity is just moving electrons. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to move electrons. These positive ions uh, out here and these negative ions in here are going to move across each other. And that's going to happen when you get a command. Remember, the commands are chemicals, neurotransmitters. Some neuron over here just sent neurotransmitters to be read by the dendrites. They send the information down through the body to the axon and these ions start being moved. The homeostasis and transport chapter of bio one, we talked about active transport forcing things to move, right? So we're going to force these ions to move in and out and rubbing past each other generates an electric charge. That was an actual electric current being generated down this axon, this tail of the neuron. And when that electric current gets to the end, to the neurotransmitter, that electricity is going to push neurotransmitters out the tail. That's right, we keep neurotransmitters in the axon terminals. And that's gonna be whispered down the lane all the way through. Electric charge pushes neurotransmitters, which causes another electric charge, which pushes more neurotransmitters, so on and so forth through your entire nervous system, from your brain to whatever part of your body you're trying to command. So looking deep inside your head, your brain is made up of all of these neurons. It's just a pile of neurons all interconnected and talking to each other by passing on those neurotransmitters. And yes, look at this. You actually have to keep resupplying. Once you use them, you can run out. Bio one, remember protein synthesis, making proteins. That's what these things are made out of. So we're going to make new proteins and then resupply them to your axon terminal. So you see now they are all in their own little bubbles. We call those bubbles vesicles. These vesicles are made out of the same thing as this membrane. So if they're made out of the same thing, they can join together and push the chemicals out. And here's how it happens. Here's the vesicle made out of the same stuff as the membrane, the lipids. Bio one, phospholipid bilayer, ring a bell. There's the phospholipids, a head and tails, and then the head and tails, bilayer, two layers, surrounding your neurotransmitters. And they are going to connect with the cell's membrane, the neuron's membrane. Open it up and kick your chemicals out. That required an electric current. Now here's a video showing the next part. Coming in on another axon terminal, you saw electric current come in and kick those chemicals out. But then look, they all attach to these things. These are called receptors, receiving the neurotransmitters. So we have the axon terminal with the vesicles full of neurotransmitters. Oh, that was a lot of big words. 
This is what this is where your hormones are. And then the dendrite that is full of receptors. And then in between them is what we call a synapse, the empty space in between. That's a synapse. Electric current kicks chemicals, hormones, neurotransmitters, whatever, across the synapse, and they get picked up by the receptors, which sends the information into the next neuron. Over and over and over again, different chemicals for different thoughts, for different feelings, for different messages. That space in between is called a synapse. The space in between the axon terminal and the dendrite of the next neuron over. So there's everything we just talked about, but here is it written down. So the bioelectricity cannot travel across a synapse. So we are going to be sending those chemicals, those neurotransmitters across. The bioelectricity's job is to push them across. And that's everything we just saw in those videos. But again, here's a picture of it happening here. Electric impulse and the vesicles full of your neurotransmitters, and they get pushed across the synapse into the dendrite. Big picture here, axon, axon terminal, next neuron, and they're touching the dendrites. All this information is being fed into the next neuron and it'll lather, rinse, repeat. Those chemicals are gonna tell the next neuron to send an electric impulse down its axon to send neurotransmitters out of its axon terminal. And that's gonna keep happening over and over and over again until it gets to whatever part of your body you're trying to communicate with. Last chapter, we talked about how that last neuron told the muscle what to do. Now we're gonna have a whole bunch of different kinds of neurotransmitters, more than I can actually teach you in this uh, chapter. So we're just gonna lump them into two categories. We're gonna call them excitatory action uh, neurotransmitters or inhibitory action neurotransmitters. Excitatory, what does that sound like? That sounds like, yes, we're gonna do a thing, woo! One example I wanna talk about is called histamine. We talked about histamine before. You should recognize that. This is that neurotransmitter, a hormone that tells your body, to, tells your nose to get all stuffed up when you start getting all the pollen in the air. So you can't actually breathe it all in because you don't want to breathe all of, of that in. So that's actually a good thing. Your body is exciting the nerves and muscles and all the different parts of your nasal passage to swell up on purpose. So you're making that happen. That is what excitatory is. It's going to increase the impulse of the next neuron. So your electricity is coming down, which pushes the neurotransmitters out, which gets accepted by the dendrite, which causes the cell, the neuron to make more uh, electric impulses. By the way, this is drawn incorrectly. You are not gonna have an electric impulse in a dendrite, all right? The, I just put that there so that you know that electricity will eventually be generated. So these neurotransmitters are causing, eventually, a bioelectric impulse, what we call an action potential. So that last one was histamine, and we don't really don't like that to happen. It's uncomfortable, so we may want to we may want to stop it, right? So to fight an excitatory action neurotransmitter, we want an inhibitory action neurotransmitter. Inhibitory means to slow down or prevent, to stop. And our example for this is going to be antihistamines. If the last one was histamine that made you all clogged up, then to open yourself back up, you're gonna want an antihistamine. And you can buy that at the drugstore. And is that, that's the uh, Benadryl, the pink pill you take whenever you're getting all sinusy and clogged up, right? What's happening right now is the histamines are being sent across. And we're gonna take the antihistamine, which will eventually make it to your nervous system and start supplying. And it's going to decrease the impulse, right? before we had two electric charges coming down. Let me back up and show you that again. So we had two electric impulses, and now it's down to one because we decreased the amount of impulse being generated with an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And maybe that's not good enough. Maybe we take another pill, we get even more, and they'll clog up all of the receptors. That's what's happening. These histamines are being picked up by the receptors. So the inhibitory ones 
are clogging up the receptors. So these are still being sent, but this dendrite isn't receiving any of them. So here's what's really gonna happen. The electric impulse kicks the chemicals out, which get soaked in by the dendrite. And then look at the big picture on the right side. There's your electric impulse and the chemicals, the neurotransmitters being kicked out. That's gonna cause the cell to generate a new electric impulse, which is gonna kick out that cells, that neurons, neurotransmitters, which is gonna lather, rinse, repeat all the way down. And it's gonna start in your brain and eventually make its way to whatever body part is gonna need that message. And then it just travels across your body, like so. Going from one neuron to the next neuron to the next neuron until you tell your body what to do. Now what happens as if you damage one of your neurons? What happens if you damage a section of your nervous system? Say, let's remove these two. These guys were damaged in a car accident. And now you have a really large gap. And then your brain tries to tell, let's say this is going to your legs. Your brain tries to tell your legs to move. Nothing. Look at that. The signal just stops. You have damaged neurons, and probably even put these back, just not connect it, right? With those damaged neurons, your legs don't get the message. Now, there's nothing wrong with your legs. Your legs are in perfect condition. The muscles are fine, the bones are fine, but if your brain can't get the message to your legs, then they will never move because your brain can't tell them to move. This is what we call being paralyzed. It's a very serious condition, uh, but there's nothing wrong with the legs in this case. It's, part, it's a problem with the nervous system. From wherever you're damaged onward, you don't get the message. Now, sometimes you can get lucky and you can regenerate new nerve tissue and they can bypass the damaged part. And now, even though the signal stops right here, it still branches out into new nerves and reconnects. Now, if you're really lucky, it'll reconnect to where it originally left off. But sometimes, sometimes it'll connect to a whole new pathway and that original pathway still doesn't work anymore. But if it does eventually make its way to your legs again, you may have to relearn how to walk. Your brain, your body are used to using this path and now you're coming from a different direction. You may not still know how to walk and you would have to relearn. That's what physical therapy is all about. Not just making your muscles stronger, but also how to use this new neural pathway. All right guys, I'm gonna leave you off with this one last interesting thing that I've been looking up recently. I've been trying to learn all the different kinds of neurotransmitters going on in your body and all different things that they do. And I've been collecting what I think is pretty interesting, neurotransmitters associated with love. That's right, love, ladies and gentlemen. Every emotion in your body has chemicals associated with it. You know, for instance, good feelings, happiness, a reward sensation is from a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Right? But love isn't just one emotion. Love is a whole bunch of different emotions. It's a collection. So we are actually going to need a bunch of different neurotransmitters to create the feelings of love. So as I said, dopamine, that's, your, that's an excitatory neurotransmitter. It's going to cause good feelings. It's a reward. Whenever you do something that you consider to be a good thing, your body, your brain will reward you and make you feel happy. Neuroproliferin is another excitatory one. It's gonna create excitement and alertness. And I don't mean like football game, yay, that's dopamine. I'm talking like a meerkat, like, oh, what's that? That kind of excitement, put you on high alert. Endorphins are part of love, but it's an inhibitory thing. That's right, you're actually trying to stop something. This inhibits pain. You know, think like Tylenol or Excedrin, Advil. Right? It actually blocks pain, it doesn't stop pain. It actually gets in between the neurons, blocks the synapses. So the pain signal can be sent, but it will be stopped right here. So it doesn't continue.
and you never realize you're always in some kind of discomfort throughout the day. You know, maybe you've just been holding your head up all day. So your neck muscles are a little sore and you don't even realize it. The endorphins will make that go away. So you'll feel better in comparison. Oxytocin, an excitatory neurotransmitter, it creates trust, loyalty. And I don't mean like loyalty to your boss, loyalty to the nation. I mean, loyalty to a person, right? You trust that person. And serotonin, this is going to be confidence and satisfaction, excitatory. It's causing that to feel good, causing you to feel satisfied. By the way, if you were to actually combine these two in a syringe, oxytocin and serotonin, well, they're excitatory, so too much would actually overwhelm you and actually cause a lot of pain. But if you can get the measurements right, theoretically, you can cause someone to trust you, be extremely loyal to you, and confidence from the serotonin, they can be really confident in what you're saying to them. You know, if you can get the measurements right, you can convince just about anybody of anything if you can inject these chemicals into them. Just an interesting uh, theoretical thought on that. And the last one, vasopressin, an excitatory neurotransmitter that causes loyalty. And again, not the loyalty we just talked about here, because you can have this kind of loyal, oxytocin loyalty to just about everybody, but vasopressin, this is like loyalty to that one person. That stereotypical TV moment where you lock eyes with that special somebody and then like everyone else in the room just disappears and it gets hazy and you're not paying attention to anything else. And oh, that one person is the only person. That's vasopressin telling your brain to do that. So these, and plus some more that I'm still looking up to this day, are the chemical cocktail that tells your brain that you are in love. So if you could mix all of these together, ladies and gentlemen, a love potion is technically possible. Very illegal, do not do that, but possible. Now the question is, can you control it and make the person fall in love with you versus the person next to you? I don't know, but this is all theory. So. Take it for what it is. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for today. Go check out Google Classroom. There should be a worksheet waiting for you on a Google form. Work on that, and I will see you tomorrow. Have a nice day.